very special place yes. where you can make us like you. Yes. God, our heart's desire today is to hear you speak to us yes. through your word. Thank you for the praise team in this particular hymn. Yes. Well, thank you for their gifts of service. Now, would you open our eyes, open our ears, that we may hear what your spirit has to say to our hearts. Remember our preacher that is feet of but clay, and except he wash you the cleansing, Lord, he won't be fit for service. So do it again, Lord God. Do it again for the kingdom's sake. And we'll be mindful to give you the honor, the glory, and all the praise. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 While you're standing, while you're standing, would you turn with me to Genesis 32? Thank you, praise team. You may take your seats. Genesis 32. Genesis 32. Grace and joy to you, family. Grace and joy. To all of our visitors, thank you. Thank you for being with us. I want to welcome you to the New Beginnings Community Church. We are an expository teaching and preaching church. That means we believe in preaching through the entire book of the Bible, books and chapters at a time. Family? And we know that you could have been in one of over 500 churches in the Fresno metropolitan area, but you have chosen to be with us, and today we don't take your presence lightly. So thank you. We are in an eight-week series. We've been talking about faith in difficult times. Amen? Amen. And today we land in series sermon number six. Title of it is Three Lessons I Learned about wrestling with God. Yeah. I want to thank Pastor Cochran for standing in and swinging for the fence Woo. last week. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. I shouted all the way in Alabama. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for your work. Amen. Genesis 32, very familiar portion of scripture. If you haven't seen, I got it, brother. I got it, brother. If you don't, look on with that good looking neighbor. Verse 21. So the present went on before him. This is Jacob's family. But he himself lodged that night in the camp. And he arose that night, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and he crossed over the ford of Jabal. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he had saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, Jacob, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob, or trickster in the Hebrew is what it means. 28, and he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob the trickster, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen the face of God, and my life is preserved. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And amen. I'll cut it off right there. Three things I've learned about wrestling with God. You may be seen. Welcome home, John. Good to see you and your beautiful bride. Amen. There is a universal question, family, that's ringing in the universe. The question is, how does a human being wrestle with God? How
how does that which is finite wrestle with that which is infinite? How does matter grab a hold of that which is ungrabbable? How can the created thing try to force or handle the creator to do something against his will? Right. The topic itself almost makes no sense, yet the text suggests that the God of heaven and earth will stoop down from time to time and allow man the space right. to exert his puny will yeah. against the trying, fearful, uncertain, precarious situations in order to exert that puny will against the holy and all-powerful God. Can a man wrestle with God? Mm. Writing this text, I was reminded about my baby boy this week, Aaron, whom I love. When he was little, he was always trying to roughhouse with daddy. He would love to sneak up on me ambush me from some closet or some hideout. He leap on me from some object in attempts to wrestle with his father who was responsible for bringing him here. I was always three times his size, always stronger than him, always bigger than him, always his provider and his security as a child. Yet he thought he could wrestle with the one who was responsible for his existence. In his human thinking, he thought he was wrestling with his father. But the father was allowing him the space to exert himself to teach him a lesson every time he positioned his will to be taught. So does Jacob in our story. He has an appointment with God. And in his secret place, he's going to learn what it means to be taught by the Holy One in a divine wrestling match. I need to tell you the fight was fixed. And so is your fight with God. Yeah. Only fight it if you want to. The match is fixed. Secondly, in today's lesson, we're going to see how God works before he takes us through a major change in our lives. We will learn what it means to give up ourselves by looking at Jacob's life and comparing the two. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Here it is. God has to do three things in this wrestling match. One, God has to isolate him. God has to inflict him. And then in order to inspire him. Can I say that again? God has to isolate him, inflict him in order to inspire him. Let me say it again because somebody's tweeting or something right there. He has to isolate you. Then he has to inflict you in order to inspire you. That's good. That's what it means to wrestle with God. See, a lot of times you think you're going through life and you're doing something because you call yourself getting mad at God. But God allows that because he loves you. He allows you to wrestle with his will for your life because you think you know everything. So what he has to do is isolate you, oh, yeah. then hurt your little feelings ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. to inspire you to get your behind in love. Yeah. This might be a painful talk this morning. Let me give you the background so you know what's happening. Jacob has been brought to the place where God has revealed himself to him. It's in this place that Jacob forgets about what God's covenant 
was to him. And because he forgot the covenant promise of God, he became fearful of his very life being threatened. Jacob then, because of his fears, tries to appease himself and make a deal with himself while at the same time lying to himself. He's acting just like his name suggests. Trickster, surplanter. Except this time he's tricking his own self. Have you ever been there? Y'all too good for me? You know when a lie is so good, you even believe it? And it's your lie. Jacob has gone from one who knows the covenant and promise of God now digressing to his old behavior in previous chapters. I got three points today and I'll leave you alone. Number one, I'm going to talk about Jacob's insulation. Number two, Jacob's isolation. And then number three, Jacob's identification. Let's unpack it. Verse 22 and 21, I mean 22 and 23. The Bible says, and he arose. He arose that night and he took his two wives his two female servants, his 11 sons, and he crossed over the ford of Jabbok. That's an, um, an, an Old Testament Hebrew word that means the river Jordan. He's crossing over the river, and he's with his family as he does it. Then verse 23, he took them and he sent them, you see that now? over the brook. It looked like he was going with them, but he's really sending them. Right. And then the text says in verse 23, and he sent over what he had. Now, you're not to read that too fast because he was loaded. Yeah. Right. He was rich. He had thousands of sheep and cattle and property and money. He getting, he's getting rid of everything and he's pushing it way ahead out of the promised place that God had called him to be in. Okay, let me unpack it for you. When we arrive at this portion of the text, life for Jacob has brought about a change. Fear, Nichols, is making Jacob make decisions about his own security. And fear is causing him now to act out of character. Let me break it down this way. Uh, nephew Aaron, the brothers got 12 kids, two wives, two concubines, a group of servants, a lot of money, and all kind of crazy power. He's privileged. But the brother is scared to face his past because he got word that his big brother Esau, the one whose birthright he stole, is coming for a visit. And because he's afraid of big brother, in spite of who he's become, are you listening? He is acting now out of character. This text is showing us the following things. Number one, because of fear that's at work in Jacob's heart, he now moves his family over the brook 25 miles, Deacon Emmanuel, from where their family camp was. Because of fear, he moves all of his possessions that are left behind. Because of fear, he tries to insulate himself between his enemy yeah, yeah, yeah. and himself. Yeah. But he puts his family out there to get hurt. Y'all know I'm gonna run that back. What kind of man puts his family in harm's way to save him from the drama he created? What kind of father puts his babies in the way of an incoming enemy because he didn't got afraid now to deal with the mess he created? Here I come. What kind of man will take everything he's worked for and earned for those 
he loved and now push it out there and throw it all away. Let the enemy get them first before he gets him. I tell you what kind of man would do that. A low down dirty trickster. Sir Planter, whose name is Jacob. Y'all know Jacob? Jacob is all about the big three, me, myself, and I. Yeah. Are you with me here? Yeah. Jacob didn't get to the top because he was a man of integrity. He was a hustler the whole time. Are you with me here? And because it was all about Jacob, it didn't even matter that his wives and children who didn't know Uncle Esau, didn't know he was a killer, had not even been briefed that he was coming. Jacob didn't even care. He just put him out there. And I ain't gonna know something right now. I better just calm my nerves. But if you that kind of man, stay away from me. Those type of cowards are not worthy of queens. Those type of fathers are not worthy of the children that God Almighty even blessed you with. Those type of fathers are what's wrong with the community today. How many men do you know have walked away from their babies because they felt like I can't make myself, I can't feed them and me. Where y'all at? I'm talking to y'all. but you can't take care of them. And it's all about you protecting yourself. Jacob, sit down and listen. God is allowing you to wrestle like that because he's got something in store for you. Can I say some more? Fear made him unsure of himself. Fear made Jacob think that something was going to happen to him and it hadn't even happened. I just missed somebody. He knew he had mistreated Esau. He knew what kind of man Esau was. But Esau hadn't personally said, I'm coming for you. But fear is playing with his mind. Come on, say amen somewhere in here. I'm hunting for a witness this morning. Won't fear talk to you? Come on, ladies, and help me right through there. Won't fear make you believe something that ain't even happened? Fear will have you strategizing over something that ain't even came to pass. Fear will make you relocate when God ain't told you to move. But because you allow fear to override the covenant promise of God, you'll get yourself in all kind of crazy postures and positions trying to do what you think is best. And you ain't heard from God not one minute in your life. Fear made this boy imagine things that never happened before. Here it is. Fear's got him in the head now. He's imagining the wrath of Esau taking place. And it ain't even happened yet. What he's doing, he got the word in previous verses that Esau was coming with 400 men. Right? And because of what he did to Esau, he's thinking he's going to take him out. This is it. Puts his babies and his wives to insulate himself from receiving the harmful blows from their relationship. What a shame. Because of his lack of faith, he can't wait for God to move in this situation. What a shame. Because of his lack of faith, he tries to handle things himself. Minister Jones, what a shame. He doesn't realize that God has made a covenant with him to protect him. And as a result, he works all night, Lord, to prepare to meet Esau because he's fearful. He couldn't wait on God in spite of God's promise, so he took matters in his own hand. Have you been there? Yep. Come on, don't play church with me. Come on, have you been there? You can't wait on God, so you come up with your own scheme? You understand Jacob then? Yeah. Yeah. I remember the time I misbehaved against my mama. I did something she told me I better not ever do. Yeah. And I knew and my brother knew what it was I had done. I ain't telling y'all because y'all don't want y'all to judge me. That's right. <laughs> but I was wrong for what I did. And I was wrong for what I spent the money on. Oh. Don't judge me. Oh. 
And when I knew I had to face her, because you know that time always come around, right? I tried to insulate myself. I rehearsed my alibi. My alibi had an alibi. Y'all not listening. I got them stories in a row. Why? Because I was expecting mama to deal with me for what I had done. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done wrong to the one you love? And then had to lie and cheat? Come on, you better say amen and they're going to think you got it all together. Have you ever tried to fix that thing with deceit? And that's where Jacob is. It's been years since he's seen his brother. But the wrong he did to him is still fresh in his mind. And the brother's past has come back up. For now, Esau to have to face. And now he's trying to insulate himself. Tell somebody, don't insulate. Don't insulate. <laughs> Secondly, we see Jacob's isolation. Look at the text. Verse 24, the Bible says, It was then Jacob was left alone. See it? Yes, sir. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw he did not prevail, against him, he touched the socket of his hip, the man did. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, the man did. And for the break, the day of break, the breaking of day is coming. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. When you come to this particular portion of the verse, we see that Jacob was not experiencing, or rather, was not expecting, there it is, an unseen visitor in the place of God. He wasn't expecting company in his place of isolation. He purposefully isolated himself trying to escape from everyone else. The man in the text has no history. A T, here it is, daughter. He has no beginning or no end. He has no face, no name of origin. Therefore, he becomes for us what the Old Testament calls is a theophany. It's an Old Testament picture of God in human form. Here it is. It's Jesus before Matthew. Are you with me here? He shows up in Jacob's isolation. Right when he's not thinking that God is going to show up because he's taking matters in his own hands, the man shows up and wrestles with him. Here it is. According to the text, he thought he was alone. He thought he had insulated himself from danger. And even if it meant putting his family in harm's way, but God came to him in his insulation because he wanted to deal with him in isolation. I just dropped something right there. Y'all, can I say it again? God shows up because of his insulation because he's got to deal with him in isolation. Sometimes in the believer's life, God purposefully allows you to do the stuff you do. Because he knows it's going to lead you to that place of isolation. Well, he's going to get you right where he wants you. Can I say some more? I'm through tripping off of the decisions people make. Let them make them. I ain't God. Are you with me here? But God know why he allows you to make the insulating choices that you make. Because it's going to drive you to that place where you're all alone. And that's right where he wants you. Right where he can deal with you. Can I say some more? God always finds a way to deal with the fearful believer in moments of isolation. God moves in the child of God's life at unexpected times. See, when you least expect it during the crisis of fear and belief is when God shows up to reveal himself to you. Jacob's fear has brought him to the perfect crisis. 
and drove Jacob right into the isolation with God, and he don't even know it yet. Wow. All right. wow. Let me say it this way. Can I say it this way? Jacob is alone, no help, no distractions, no interferences, no interruptions, no way of escape, and no excuses why he cannot encounter God. God has set Jacob up. And Jacob thought he made the decision. Y'all ain't convinced. Why is this happening? Here's the application. God wants to do something in Jacob's life. God wants to do something in this place where God has sent him. So he shows up to strengthen him and to test him. Here it is. This wrestling match is to get Jacob to conform to the will of God and to quit conforming back into his old ways. Good question, Sister Wilson. He, 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 he's going to allow him to wrestle with him so Jacob can get to the place where God is trying to get him in. All right. And while he's getting him to that place, he's also getting him to change from his old behaviors. I want to help somebody who's trying to disciple somebody and getting frustrated. The frustration is a part of the wrestling. See, the only way you can get frustrated in discipling somebody is if you think you're making the changes. You're not in charge of nobody's transformation. We get all bent out of shape when they cuss you in Jesus. Let them run the insulation. God's got a blueprint for isolation. All right, I'm, 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 I'm off my thing, but I remember being mad at God. I quit going to church and all that. I'm going to get out. God got me out of the country one night, one foggy Friday country night in the middle of the first night. I got so high on that road I couldn't see. Y'all know what happened, huh? I went to church real quick. He spoke to that high just as clear as I'm so now. There ain't a high in there if God can't break through. They mad at God. They didn't quit. I don't know. I don't even know if I believe in God. Okay. <laughs> God don't need you to help him. That's all I'm trying to say. He's the one that disciples through you. Am I talking to you? He gets Jacob to this special place. Look at the text with me again. Verse 25. The Bible says, Now, when he saw this is the theophany, Jesus, that he did not prevail against him, that Jacob did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of his hip was out of joint. Y'all catch that? Yeah. As he wrestled with him. Y'all know God could have broke his leg, yeah. snapped it, but he just put him, gave him a little something. <laughs> According to this verse, Jacob refused to give up in the wrestling match. You catch it? Yeah. He was refusing to conform to what God wanted him to do. All right, all right, all right. So God, yeah, would not let Jacob remain in that disobedience. So what he did was inflict pain on him. Yes, yes, yes. In the place of God to get his attention. I ain't never met a professor more bad than pain. Have you ever been in this class? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some of y'all still doing the homework. Pain is God's teacher. Are you with me here? And some of us so crazy, we keep failing the class. So you go from this course to the next pain point too. God had the power to hurt him all the time. Watch this. But he wanted Jacob to willingly yes. 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 submit to 
to his will. Yeah. I don't want somebody to leave here to think somebody, God is just in the pain. No, he's not. He wants you to willingly yeah. submit to his perfect plan and will for your life. But when you don't, you got homework. Yeah. He inflicts pain. Now, when Jacob, whose name means trickster, surplanter, right, refused to give in, God had to cause him some suffering. Yeah. Where? In the place of isolation, in order for Jacob to humble himself. Y'all see that? Don't forget the big picture. Jacob, Jacob ran everybody away. And because he ran everybody away, there wasn't even nobody there to help him in his pain. That's right. That's right. That's right. God said, I'm going to inflict you, and I'm going to keep you isolated. Because he wants you to know some more about who he is. Can I show you something? Sometime in a believer's life, God, Myrna, God has to both isolate you, allow you to question and wrestle with his will for your life, then put you in a painful position, alter your physical characteristics to get you to humble yourself. Say it again. Sometimes in a believer's life, God has to both isolate you, allow you to question and wrestle with his will for your life, then put you in a painful position, alter your physical characteristics, to get you to humble yourself. And he's never going to lose. God has many a child that he's had to wrestle into submission because they refuse to come to him and give in to him from their own wills. Here it is. Because he loves you, beloved, yeah. he don't have no problem hurting you to get your attention. Amen. Because he loves you, he don't have no problem giving you a limp. Right. He does not. Just keep trying to do you. When he told you, that ain't who you are. Yeah. Yeah. You're acting out of character. That's not who I made you to be. That's not my best for you. Right. And you keep saying, yeah, yeah, but I got this. He keeps saying, okay. Right. Yeah. Am I making sense here? God wanted Jacob, I'm trying to bring it into focus. God wanted Jacob to face his brother that he had wronged. He wanted him to repent for what he had done. He wanted him to reconcile with his family. But Jacob was still trying to avoid what the Lord wanted him to do. I need you to listen. And he was willing to wrestle with God instead of submit and face the one he had wronged. So God touched him and gave him a limp as a reminder that he was God and that he could do more than he, uh, he could do more than that, yeah, if he wanted to. Yeah. And by the way, you still gonna face it. Yeah. <laughs> Question today, what's your limp today? What has God done in your life that's a reminder of where you disobeyed him? Where is your physical marker of disobedience and a lack of submission? What has God tried to get you to do and you refuse to submit to him or obey him? What a question. The text begins to turn because verse 26 says this. That the theophany, Jesus says to Jacob, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said to him, listen to this, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We usually, when we read 
that text, look at it in a whole different context. Like, I'm holding on to the blessings of God. That ain't what that text was talking about. Drew was in the fight of his life. And he just got his skip knocked out of place. Come on, ladies that have babies. Y'all know that's painful, ain't it? He ain't talking about blessing me. He talking about bless, don't hurt me no more. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I hope y'all underline that. Next time you hear that verse quoted, and say, that ain't what that means. Yeah. Right? Look at the text again. When you come to this portion of the text, you see a conversation, watch this now, happening to you between God and Jacob. God says, let me go. But Jacob said, God, I can't do that. Something has happened to Jacob during the match. After his kip is out of socket, he's now hanging on for his life. And he's in no position to wrestle anymore. Yet he's clinging to God for his existence. He's now willing to do whatever God wants him to do. Except let him go. Y'all catch that right there? Here it is. God has got his attention. And he got it during the midnight hour. I just dropped something right there. Wasn't it midnight when he got your attention? Yes, sir. Wasn't you in the, the center of darkness when he got your attention? Look, God has made him depend on somebody other than himself. Jacob has been wrestling out of fear, Jones, and disobedience, but now he's coming to the presence of Christ and he recognizes who this is. Here it is. God has his attention. And Jacob is finally dependent upon God and God alone, and he's holding on because he can't make it without him. He needs God to survive. He's literally crying, God, don't kill me. You know, there's times in the child of God's life that God has to get your attention to. And God still uses isolation to drive us into his presence. When we get along with God and wrestle with him about our ways versus his ways, he will sometimes inflict pain on us to get us to surrender our will for his will. Parents, quit fighting with your children about the, the plans for their life. Once they become grown, get out of the way. Let them wrestle. God got something for them. If you committed them to God at the altar when they were babies, you want them to be isolated with God. I'm not feeling it. Here it is. God loved them enough to hurt them. Just like you do. Come on, mama. It's a rule I can slap fire from him right now. That don't mean you don't like him. That means you just ain't pleased with him. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got one, right, one righteous witness in the room. <laughs> I'm so glad that God loved me enough to hurt me. But God never uses anyone greatly until he has hurt them deeply. Can I say that again? When you check the biblical record of men, every last one of them that had to be isolated, insulated, and crushed by God in order to be used by God. It ain't in our human DNA to behave. I just dropped something right there. And nobody, and okay, let me be theologically about this thing. There are none that are righteous, no, not one. Can I say some more? I want to ask a question, but I don't think I got no witnesses. Is there anybody here ever had to wrestle with God over an issue in your life? Is there anybody here ever been hurt? By the hand of the Almighty God. Oh, now y'all Baptists. I know you Baptists now. Is there anybody here who knows how difficult it is to wrestle with God over a decision that you made? 
Is there anybody here ever been hurt by God for your own good? And you got a tattoo now to remind you. <laughs> this is what God with my gluteus maximus. I told y'all the story earlier about my baby boy who I love him and how we used to wrestle when he was a boy. And I can remember there were times when he actually thought he could win. <laughs> and I would have to literally put him in a position with a sufficient amount of pain to help him to surrender. Y'all catch me? But even in his surrender, there would be times that his flesh would want him to hold on and stay connected, even through the pain. That's what Jacob is. God's got his attention. He's inflicted him with pain. But now that he's in communion with God, yeah. he don't want to let him go. He was hurting, watch this, but it was the pain yeah. that drew him closer to God yeah. in the course of the match. Yeah. Ah, can I say it like I feel it? Yeah. We oftentimes pray for people who are disobedient, Lord have mercy. But the older I get, I'm starting to think, I'm going to start praying now. <laughs> I'm going to pray, Lord, turn up the pain. <laughs> Can I tell you why? Pain is the catalyst for reconciliation. Pain is the teacher for submission. Pain is the coach of humility. Pain is what draws them into that intimate, sacred place where they hold on for their life. Because the one who is inflicting them is the one who's deeply in love with them. And every time I cry for mercy, God says, you want me to let him go? I ain't through with him yet. Did you catch it? Jacob was hurting, but he understood now theologically that even though I'm in pain, I'm right in the arms or latching on to the one I need to be with. So I can't let you go until you bless me. Well, I've been here too long. I've talked about his isolation, his insulation, his isolation. Let me show you now his identification. Because something happens to him in a wrestling match where his theology changed. And now his identity changes. Yeah. I'm through after this. The Bible says in 27, so he said to Jacob, what's your name? And Jacob says, I'm Jacob. In the Hebrew it means surplanter, trickster, right? Deceiving one. It's a confession right there. And God says to him in verse 28, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but now it shall be Israel. For you have struggled with God and with me, and you have prevailed. Yeah. Let me press across the field. As we come to the close of the chapter, after God hurts Jacob to help Jacob, he changed his identity. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't the same man he was before the wrestling match began. He walked different now. Gotta live. He talked differently now. He thought differently now. His name was changed. And he had seen God face to face. Y'all catch that? He had an encounter with God. And this made the difference in his life. The change that came to him came as a result, you guys, of his divine encounter with God. Amen. If Jacob does not wrestle with God and get inflicted with pain, he stays the same way. It was his name that made him act out of character. Ah, because his mama named him a trickster. He grew up all life thinking he was a Trickster. Caesar Clark said, 
be careful what you name your babies. Names have a way of bringing strange identities. And that's why I'm so glad that when God saved you, he changed your name. Teachers called you a fool, an idiot, incapable of learning. Some other folks called you some other things. But then when God called you, he called you a child of God. Sons and daughters, priests and priestesses. Are you listening here? Isn't that powerful? Jacob's name was Sir Planter. He changes his name to Israel, which means this. He will rule as God. Did you catch that right there? He goes from Sir Planter and Trickster, Trickster to the one that he will rule as God. Why is that powerful? Because his text says this, you shall be called Israel because you struggle with God and with men and you have prevailed. He will rule as God. Are you with me here? With this new title and this new change came new characteristics, new behavior. And Jesus chooses Jacob to give him this title. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because he's going to use his bloodline to come into the world as the savior of men. Notice. But he doesn't decide to come through Jacob until Jacob's been converted. God wants to use you, but I guarantee you, he'll never use you until you convert it. A lot of us want to be used by God, but we ain't been converted. We've been engaged. We've been involved. We've been in Bible school. Are you with me here? But he ain't really got all of you yet. Remember what he said to Peter? Right? Satan has desired to sift you. Like we, but it's okay. I'll pray for you. And when you what? Get converted. Then strengthen the brother. Because you can't do nothing like you are right now. God can't really use you like he wants to use you until he first inflicts you. And after he inflicts you, then he converts you and promotes you. Am I making sense? Yeah. Let's talk about a table today that after you wrestle with God and see him touch your life, the child of God ought to have a new walk. They ought to have a new man. They ought to have a new understanding. After they've had a divine encounter with God, we are not still be like the old man or old woman we used to be before or after, rather, we wrestle with God. After we have wrestled with God, we ought to be wiser, stronger, and better able to understand who God is after we have encountered Him. Well, I got to leave you long. Thank, thank you for your patience and allowing me to walk through the text. But the Bible says in verse 30, and I'm through, he's got his identity. Jacob called the name, this is interesting, of that place, Peniel. For it means, I have seen the face of God, and my life has been preserved. I'm through when I tell you this. The theology of place is real in the Bible. Names, places, and things often attribute divine activity to the life of the one that God is impacting, inflicting, or trying to isolate. So in scripture, when a man or a woman meets God, God does something, oftentimes you see them identify the place or give it a name. What Jacob does right here is say to you and I, this is the place I've seen God face to face. He got a name and he got a place. Don't miss that, guys. Where his transformation happened. He got a name and he got a place where he did business with God. He called it Peniel, the place where he saw God face to face. And after he saw God, he had a place to remember where it took place. Uh, after he saw God, he got a place where he could remember and he could always return to. After he saw God, he got a marker that was unforgettable. He got a location 
where he was identified and was changed forever. Do you have a place like that? I do. I have a place like that. And I love to go there. I like to go to that place often because it's in that place where I got my name changed. It's in that place where I know God touched me. It's in that place where the Lord made a difference in my heart. It's in that place, Billy, where God made me do business with him. That place was Calvary. At Calvary, the Lord visited me in my insulation. At Calvary, he arrested me with his isolation. And at Calvary, he saved me, giving me a new identification. He revealed at Calvary he was my savior, my sacrifice, my source for living, my salvation, my security. He met me where I was by dying for my sins out on the cross. It wasn't until I got a good look at the cross and my wrestling with God ceased. I recognized at the cross he was doing business with me. Let your baby go. God know how to get them to the cross. They may come kicking and screaming. They may come limping or in a wheelchair. You don't care how they get there. Just let God get them there. His death touched me. Changed my life. His death knocked some sense into me. His death impacted my walk, my talk, my thoughts, my identity. And I've been hit by the hand of God at Calvary. When I wrestled with him at the cross, he showed me his will for my life. When I wrestled with him at the cross, he showed me what he was doing in my life. When I wrestled with him at the cross, he showed me how much he loved me. And because of that love, he went into a moral tomb. Because of that love, he took the sting out of death for me. Because of that love, the Father raised him early Sunday morning. Now he sits at the right hand of God. Now that he has risen, I can identify with him on my sins. My Savior, I'm through. But these are the three things I learned about wrestling with God. Number one, I learned that when I'm wrestling with God over control of my life, I am not to try to insulate myself from God as he's trying to deal with me. Number two, I learned that when I'm wrestling with God over obedience in my life, God will always isolate me to deal with me. I may think it's my plan by running here to do this or running here to do that. God allows me to make those plans because he's going to deal with me when I get there. Right, right sir. Number three, I've learned that when I'm wrestling with God, I'm extremely prone to holding on to him until he bless me or cease from giving me the pain that he's inflicted on me. God's will for me during these times is to identify with him through the lessons that he is teaching me on the journey. And finally, no believer gets out of earth without the painful hand of the divine touching you to conform you to his will. Amen. And all God's children say amen. amen. Can you bow me forward with prayer? Jesus, 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 there is something about